On September 21st, 2023, Netflix released the long-awaited fourth and final season of their hit show, Sex Education. And people are not happy. Yeah, I'm gonna cut to the chase here. People hate this season. It's kind of insane how negative the response to it has been. I didn't watch the season the day it came out. It took me a few days, but by the time I finally got to sit down and watch it, the internet had already been plagued with an army of angry fans completely rejecting the entirety of this final entry. Whether it's on Reddit, on Twitter, help you guys have been sending me hundreds hundreds upon hundreds of DMs on Instagram to express your dislike of it. Which, by the way, follow me on Instagram. We have a lot of fun there. Audiences were extremely disappointed with Sex Education 4. There is no way around it, and I was really, really curious to see why. Sex Education is a show that is very near and dear to my heart, for reasons that I already explained in past videos. You're welcome to go watch that if you haven't. But it is a show I'm always willing to give the benefit of the doubt to, even when it's not being amazing. I made a video about season 3 where I go into excruciating detail about why a lot of the season doesn't work despite still being somewhat good, and I honestly had no idea what to expect for season 4. So, over the last couple of days, I've been sitting down and watching the final 8 episodes of Sex Education. I watched the season... And I get it. I understand why people are so disappointed with this season. I get why they hate it. I get why they hate it so vocally. And for the record, I'm gonna get this out of the way right now, I didn't outright hate this season. But while I didn't hate it, I also can't really say I liked it. I can't really call it a good season, because it's just not. Sex Education 4 is riddled with problems that are impossible to ignore. I was kind of confused the whole time I was watching it because it makes so many decisions that I just don't understand. But it also does a number of things that work. The least I can say is that I feel conflicted about season 4, but in the end, I think this final season unfortunately does more bad than it does good, which kind of breaks my heart a little because you guys know how much I love this show. But I I just gotta be honest here, where season 3 made mistakes that were fixable in some aspects, the negative sides of season 4 are quite irredeemable, especially now that the show is over. My biggest primary issue with Sex Education 4 is something that I told myself in every single episode of the season while I was watching it, and it's simply that this season does not feel like a final season. This doesn't feel like the conclusion to a larger story. It feels like a very random side chapter that equally as randomly turns into an ending at the very last minute. The entire time I was watching it, I felt like something was missing. I kept telling myself out loud that this did not feel like the end. Long story short, this season feels like the writers wrote it without knowing it was the final season, and then rush to write an ending at the last minute. That's what I told myself, and I couldn't really shake that thought the entire time I was watching. So, after I finished the season, I looked into it, and it turns out... That's exactly what happened. Let me contextualize for you. After the backlash the season got right when it came out, a writer on the show named Yasmin Benoit came out with some tweets expressing her frustrations with how the show was handled. We'll talk a bit more about that later, definitely remember Yasmin's name, she's very important to this video. But the interesting part for now is that in one response to a fan on Twitter who criticized the writing of this new season, Yasmin admitted point blank that the writers of the show did didn't know season 4 was gonna be the final season when they were writing it. They found out this was the end of the show very late in the process, and by the time they were told, the story of the season was almost completely done. So what I assume is that they were out of time and couldn't just rewrite the season to make the ending they wanted, so all they could do was take the season they had already written and quickly rework the ending to attempt to make it a series finale. That's why this season 
season doesn't feel like a final season. It's because it wasn't supposed to be. Sex Education 4 was just meant to be a new chapter that would later lead to more chapters. But Netflix probably forced their hand to make it a final season anyway at the very last second. Now, does that excuse all the flaws of the season? No, absolutely not. Final season or not, Sex Education 4 has some major issues that would be impossible to ignore regardless. But I do think it heavily contributes to explaining why this season feels so weird and so incomplete. A few weeks ago, I made a video about the downfall of The Mandalorian, a show that I unabashedly loved, but that took a strange direction that I didn't quite follow. And I kind of find it funny because on paper, The Mandalorian and Sex Education don't really have anything in common. They actually could not be more different as shows, but their trajectories over time are kind of similar. They're both shows that feel like they outlive their own idea and now just seem to be existing just for the sake of existing. They're just kind of doing whatever with no real sense of direction and no real point. And it leaves the show feeling somewhat familiar, but also weirdly empty. There's something missing and it's very hard not to notice. We're gonna talk about all of that in more details, but first, I want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a massive online community where you can learn pretty much anything you want. Like, really anything. A lot of you guys send me DMs asking me about my editing or about my directing on music videos, and let me tell you, Skillshare is exactly where you want to go for that. The best way I can describe it is, Skillshare is basically an infinite pool of knowledge. There are literally thousands of really interesting classes for curious and creative people about pretty much anything you would like to explore or any goal you would like to reach. You want to learn about illustration? They got it. Web Web development? They got it. Social media management? They got it. You want to figure out how to write a good script? Well, there's a class for that too. Like anything you can think of, it's there. Personally, one of my big goals this year was the goal of achieving a better work-life balance because work has become a very, very large part of my existence and I want to be able to find a good middle ground to be present in other aspects of my life. So it's been really helpful to discover the productivity and time management classes curated by Skillshare to help me figure things out. I'm also fascinated with animation and I've been thinking more and more about making my own and this class, by by Danny Fisher Shin has been the perfect starting point I've been looking for to get into it. Honestly, no goal is too small with Skillshare. You can find a class to learn anything. And you know what? You guys are in luck because the first 500 people to use my link in the description will be able to get a month free trial of Skillshare. And broski, not only are you getting a whole month for free, you will also get 40% off your first year of membership. Dude, it's easily the best deal they've ever had. You can go and explore the platform and learn about anything that is of interest to you for an entire month for free. Anything you want, the whole thing will be at your disposal. So this is your chance to go and explore any topic you're curious about. So check out the link in my description, join Skillshare, and start learning. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. You guys are the best, and let's get back to Sex Education. So Sex Education 4 picks up about four or five months after the events of season three. Otis and Maeve, who have now fully admitted their feelings for each other, are currently separated due to Maeve moving to the United States to join a super prestigious school for her writing, and they're in a sort of long distance relationship. Otis and all the other students of Moordale High we've come to know and love are now about to enter a college. They came out victorious against Hope Haddon, the villain of season three, who completely reshaped their school in a tyrannic regime, but it resulted in their school closing down. And now they are entering Cavendish College, which is the new primary setting of the show. We meet again with Otis's best friend Eric, his ex-girlfriend Ruby, and a bunch of familiar faces as they try to make sense of this new environment. Otis naturally seeks a way to establish a new sex clinic where he can help people in need, but is horrified to discover that Cavendish already 
already has a sex clinic ran by a mysterious young woman only known as O. Now, as you'll see later, that is a very, very surface level synopsis of the season, but I think the meat of the conversation is gonna be there. Notably, when it comes to the show's new star setting, Cavendish College. This setting drastically changes the vibe of the show. It's a big, big change for the story because it comes with a bunch of new things. And unfortunately, Cavendish College not only serves as a complete reset of the show's status quo, it is also the source of most of the season's problems. But before we jump into all of the issues I have with season 4, I do want to talk about what I liked about it. Because yes, despite the aggressively negative reaction to the season, I do believe Sex Education 4 does a number of things right and these things deserve to be pointed out. So, let's jump in. Number one, the good stuff. The first thing I wanna point out with this season is just how gorgeous it looks visually. Sex Education was always a very good looking show with its vibrant colors, impeccable set design, and the fashion attributed to its characters. And season four does not disappoint on that front. This season looks fucking amazing. It is so beautiful to look at. Cavendish College is stunning. It does go a bit overboard with every single aspect of the school being coated in pastel colors, even down to the wardrobe given to the extras in the scenes, but it does give Cavendish and the season as a whole its very own visual identity and its own atmosphere. It's also a very effective contrast as the polar opposite to season 3, which saw its villain quite literally suck the life out of Moordale High by having everyone dress in shades of grey. It's clever, it's a very intelligent way to indicate change, and when it comes to its visuals, the show deserves all the praise in the world for its very subtle attention to detail. The performances are also still, for the most part, really Good. A lot of the OG cast really gets to shine this season. Others, not so much, but we'll talk about that later. Special mention to Gillian Anderson, who probably has her most difficult season yet as Otis's mom, Jean. For the quick reminder, at the end of the last season, Jean gave birth to a daughter and almost died in labor. Thankfully, she didn't, but she immediately found out after that in a gut punch of a cliffhanger that her boyfriend, Jakob, was not the father of this new child. And we learned this season that as a result of that revelation, Jakob left her after the little girl was born. Now, if you've seen my video about season three, you know that I was not the biggest fan of Jean's storyline last season. I thought a lot of it was boring and felt cheap, and overall, Jean just didn't have much to do in season three. Gillian Anderson is always perfect in this role, but the character was just lacking. However, I think season 4 fixes that. This season really breaks Jean in half. Up till this point, we always got to know Jean as this badass woman who is really on top of things and super confident in herself. But this season, she is in a completely different position where she is just excessively overwhelmed and doesn't really know what to do. She hasn't had to take care of a baby since Otis, and she is just not in her element here. We come to learn that she is struggling with postpartum depression, and she is also dealing with severe heartbreak, because again, Jakob left her after finding out that Joy was not his daughter. This season is emotionally brutal for Jean. We get a version of the character that is the complete opposite of what we've known before. The usually calm and collected, hyper-confident woman who feels invincible is now completely defeated. She's broken and sad, she feels lonely and completely overwhelmed by everything, and at the same time, this season takes the opportunity to address Jean's complete inability to ask for help, which makes sense for her character. She's always kinda done everything on her own, and we realize that it's really difficult for her to admit that she can't do that this time. She's a shell of a human this season, she's barely recognizable. She doesn't even recognize herself. She doesn't feel like herself, and it's affecting every single aspect of her life. Watching her as she attempts to find a new balance is honestly very emotionally compelling, and Gillian Anderson brings her absolute A-game to that storyline. And I knew that the most important thing was that I was there for Otis, and so I decided that all running my clinic would be enough. 
I think it's a very fitting final arc for Jean, and I'm glad the character got to go out on such a strong note. Another great point of the season, in my opinion, is Maeve. Now, if you remember, last season, I grew a little frustrated with the writing given to Maeve. I didn't outright dislike it, but it felt like the character was going in circles and going through the exact same arc in every season, over and over and over again, to the point where aspects of her character just stopped making sense. You know, it's no secret that I absolutely adore Maeve. She's a very precious character to me. I fell in love with her in season one, and I never stopped loving her, unlike some other characters we'll talk about later. Emma Mackey is just incredible in this role, and just like Gillian Anderson, even when the character is not at her best, she is still fucking killing it with her performance. But thankfully, Maeve's writing this season is pretty strong. While I wasn't really into her storyline in the US, I think her final arc really picks up when she returns to Moordale after learning that her mother had a drug overdose and died. I am very sorry to inform you that your mother has passed away. Shortly after she was admitted to ICU, she lost consciousness. It's a really abrupt shift in her story, but a necessary one. It allows Maeve to go through a completely different type of arc. One that brings traits of her character that are very faithful to what she was like in season one. Her grief is heartbreaking and also very lonely, and the overarching theme of her being what is left of a child that was raised by an addict is really strong. Her monologue during the funeral, where she explains explains her complicated feelings for her mother is incredibly well written in a way that feels very consistent with her character. A mother can be a pretty shit parent sometimes and you can still love them and want them to get better and someone can be an addict and still be generous and kind. The idea that she could never quite reconcile the fact that she loved her mother deeply but also hated her is just so on point for Maeve. And the added element of her brother lashing out because he feels alone and he believes he's going to end up just like his mom after Maeve leaves him behind also works really well. I was never a fan of Maeve's brother but I really like what he brought to the table emotionally this season. I'd say the one thing about this storyline that didn't fully make sense to me is that Maeve is supposed to have a little sister named Elsie who is three or four years old and she's not mentioned at all this entire season. Their mom died and she doesn't even come up. She's not even at the funeral. Now I don't know if I missed something but I'm pretty sure that's never explained. But yeah, overall I think this storyline was quite amazing and Maeve gets an ending that really fits her character and makes perfect sense to me. The arc of her mother's death really seals the deal for her and I know a lot of people were pissed off that she went back to America at the end but I actually like that a lot for her? With her mother dead, her brother gone, and her sister that wasn't mentioned technically being taken care of, Maeve doesn't have anything keeping her in Moordale. If anything, Moordale always held her back. And while through meeting Otis and opening up to Amy, she learned not to be alone and learned to love and be loved, Maeve has only ever felt truly happy and at peace when she was in America. She's never felt like she belonged in Moordale. She always felt out of place there. And getting that opportunity in the US is the first time where Mae finally gets to live for something she wants for herself, rather than just surviving by the skin of her neck. It's kind of a no-brainer for her, and I think it makes perfect sense for her to choose America. Especially after her conversation with Jean, who tells her she's worth pursuing her dreams. This arc is very much allowing her to feel secure in that decision and to move forward to allow herself to start a new chapter where she has a chance after closing a chapter where the odds were constantly against her. I personally think it would have felt incredibly cheap if Maeve had ended the show by choosing to stay in Moordale for Otis. And, of course, you can't talk about sex education wins without talking about Adam Groff, everyone's favorite character. Adam, unsurprisingly, has a great arc this season that feels like a very logical continuation to his arc in season 3. After having his heart 
broken by Eric, Adam feels directionless and wants to do something that makes him feel useful. Mordale High closes after the whole Hope Haddon thing and he decides that school is not working out for him, so he decides to take a job in a farm so he can work with animals. And as a result, Adam has a final storyline that is completely removed from the rest of the show. He doesn't interact with any of the main cast until episode 6, which is basically the end of the season, and he only talks to one person. His final conversation with Eric is only here to give him closure, but he literally does not interact with any of the main cast for the rest of the season. He's basically in his own miniseries, but again, if you look at it, it makes perfect sense. Adam's story through the show is divided in four distinct arcs that are all very logical. In season one, he figures out his personality. He learns to understand why he hates himself so much and eventually finds a deep desire to change and become a better person. In season two, that desire to change comes with him learning to build friendships, which he does with Ola, and he learns a whole lot about himself in the process. In season three, his arc then turns to romantic relationships, and he learns a great deal about himself through that too, especially when he is left with his first heartbreak after dating Eric, who treated him like garbage by the way. And in season 4, Adam's story concludes with a final arc that is his family, which just makes sense. Coming full circle by having his last chapter be about fixing his relationship with his dad, the very relationship that has been the root of all of the things he hated the most about himself and most of the flaws he came to overcome, is a very logical and satisfying conclusion to his story as a character. He literally did it all. He learned to accept himself as he is, to love himself as he is, he becomes a better person, which was his greatest desire. He he found his path in life by working with animals, finding a place where he feels like he belongs, and he now gets to reconnect and repair the last broken element of his life, which is his relationship with his father, which eventually leads to his family being reunited as his parents decide to give each other another chance. It's fucking amazing. The entire story of the Groff family from season 1 to season 4 is basically perfect television. And while you see that a lot in Adam, I think it's especially visible with his dad, Michael. Listen, now that the show is over, I'm just gonna say it. I can say with confidence that Michael Groff off is easily the best character in sex education. Period. I don't care what you say, you can argue with the wall, I don't care. The character arc this man gets in seasons 3 and 4 is so fucking touching. And I said that in the last video, but I fucking hated Michael Groff in season 2. I thought they had made him way too much of a cartoon villain and I did not enjoy him at all. But they really bulldozed his life in season 2 so he could then have one of the best redemption arcs I've ever seen on TV. After ruining his own life in season 2, losing his wife and son in the process, season 3 sees Michael attempting to work on himself with absolutely nothing left. He realizes that he is an impossibly toxic human being, a cold, mean, and deplorable man, and he hates it. He hates himself, and he wants to figure out who he wants to be. Season 3 has him make a genuine attempt at being a better person. He's at rock bottom, and he he wants to build a new foundation for his life that would entirely be based on his growth as a human, and season 4 is a fantastic continuation and conclusion to this story. While he spends season 3 trying to convince his wife Maureen to take him back, which he ends up failing to do, season 4 really focuses on Michael realizing he was an awful father to Adam, and trying to make up for that. He spends the season attempting to connect with him and to actually get to know him, because he was never really interested interested in who his son was as a person. It's definitely a bumpy road, but watching them bond and slowly learn to accept and enjoy each other's company was a really endearing little piece of storytelling. And Michael finally getting to tell Adam that he loves him and regrets being such an emotionally unavailable parent was great. I love you. You're my son. I just don't like myself. Having their story reach its climax by having them hug for the first time was incredibly emotional and, again, makes both their storylines come full circle. It's just brilliant writing. 
I am working on myself. I'm doing therapy. Michael Groff is just a beautiful, beautiful story about change. The lessons tied to his character are portrayed so well. He's the ultimate representation of how a person can always make the choice to be better. You can always choose to grow. It's never too late. He shows that your mistakes don't define you if you refuse to let them define you. You can fuck up and hurt the people in your life and it's painful it's embarrassing it makes you feel like a shit person and you just want to give up when everyone you love turns their back on you but even when you are at your lowest and at your loneliest even if you don't like who you are right now there is always a road ahead you can always choose to work on yourself choose to attempt to make amends choose to give yourself and open up yourself to make things right to be someone you can be proud of and that you're loved ones can be proud of. I think Michael Groff is one of the characters that portrays these themes the best. I find his arc to be outstanding and he is the best character in sex education period. Amy also has a storyline I really enjoyed this season. Not all of it, we'll talk about it more later, but everything that had to do directly with her and her mental state and her healing process from her traumatic experiences was, in my opinion, really well done. Having it be illustrated with her finding the strength to take out the pair of jeans she was wearing when she was sexually assaulted in season 2 and wear them again is a fantastic full circle moment that really fits her character. I like that she pursues art as a way to express herself, but that it takes her a while to even figure out what she wants to express. She says that she doesn't think she understands art, but by the end of the season, she becomes a skilled photographer with a strong message and realizes that art is not necessarily something you understand, it's something you feel. Her finding it in herself to channel all of the frustration, the pain, the trauma, and the injustice she felt and carried since the incident and make it something tangible that she gets to control is incredibly good for her character. And I think it is also a perfectly logical end to her story. I also like that the show recontextualizes what it means for her to be a friend. Amy is such an insanely devoted friend to Maeve, which I always really appreciated. Like, the speed at which she agrees to let go of her feelings for Isaac, the second Maeve says she feels uncomfortable about it, without even a question in her mind is really endearing. Ames, I think the Isaac thing makes me uncomfortable. Do you reckon you two could be friends? Yes, absolutely. I should never have brought it up, seriously. I mean, nothing happened, and nothing ever will happen. She's like the Roronoa Zoro to Maeve's Monkey D. Luffy. Her insane loyalty is just such a big part of her charm, but it can also be to her detriment. Like, if you remember, when we meet Amy in season one, we see that she's ready to put herself in very uncomfortable situations to please her friends, and it often leads to people taking advantage of her because they know she won't have it in her to stand up for herself. However, Maeve does recognize that denying Amy Amy a chance at happiness with Isaac was unfair and she takes those words back. It shows that Amy is still a loyal friend, but now the friends she gives that loyalty to no longer take it for granted. I also liked Cal way more this season. Not that I disliked them in season 3 when they were introduced, but there wasn't much to them then. We're told they're non-binary, and that's about it. There's never anything more brought to the table. This season, though, is way more impactful for Cal. They're basically dealing with a very bad case of gender dysphoria, and they feel extremely misunderstood in their identity. They feel alone after sort of losing their relationship with Jackson, and they don't really know how to deal with certain changes they've been experiencing since being on testosterone. I'm not sure how I feel about the lack of resolution in their story. We'll talk about the finale more later, but basically the show heavily implies that Cal almost unalived themselves, and then we see them say they're not ready to face people after that, and then that's kind of it? 
the show just ends. I really liked Cal's story this season, but it just feels very incomplete. With that said though, yes, Cal was greatly improved and I really enjoyed watching them being given more layers and a much, much stronger storyline than season 3. So yeah, I don't want to sit here and pretend everything about this season was ass. There is still some good in this show and I think it does do a solid job at ending some of these characters' stories. And there's a bunch of small little moments that I really liked and that made me smile from ear to ear. Like Jackson and Viv's relationship taking center stage again, Amy clapping back at men cat calling her, Joffrey Baratheon having a cameo, Ruby's absolutely flawless fashion. I really like the scene where Maeve and Jean come face to face in episode 5. Like again, we find out that Moredale High, the high school the characters were in for the first three seasons, closed down after the events of season 3 and is now just completely abandoned. And then the show hits you with a fantastic cliffhanger when Maeve and Otis get arrested for trespassing and going into the abandoned building at night and Jean has to come get them. And in that moment, you're reminded quite brutally that Jean has never met Maeve before. For the first three seasons of the show, she's only ever heard about her. And there was always a huge discussion among fans of when Jean would finally meet Maeve, and this is the moment. Maeve meets Otis's mom for the very first time after she gets him arrested. Mom, this is Maeve. Hello, Maeve. It's just really good. Like, the season has some little moments like that that just hit right. That said, though, there's also a bunch of things in the season that I didn't particularly like, but also didn't particularly hate. I think that's one of the most surprising things to me about the season. Like, a lot of stuff left me feeling very indifferent, which I am not used to with sex education, and I can't really put these things in the good stuff portion or the bad stuff portion. So I guess we're gonna need an extra category. Number two, things I feel kinda neutral about. The first storyline that left me with a shrug is Jackson's storyline. Again, I didn't dislike it, but I also didn't care all that much. I do like Jackson as a character. I like him a lot, actually, even though it seems like the writers never really figured out what to do with him after season two. And his arc this season is just odd. Him having a health scare after a girl he hooks up with tells him she felt something while playing with his balls is fine. Like he thinks he may have cancer or whatever. Like I don't mind it. But then in the last like third of the season, this storyline just shifts into something else entirely a little bit out of nowhere. Suddenly, Jackson wants to know who his biological father is but his moms are being sketchy about it. We discover that when he was a child, his moms made him an adorable little book where he got to learn about how he was born thanks to a sperm donor who allowed his moms to have their most precious gift. I really fucking liked that. I thought it was so cute and such a charming thing to do for children with same-sex parents. But then the show does this really weird thing where it turns out that this book was sort of a lie because Jackson finds out at the end of the show that his biological mom got pregnant with him before meeting his other mom after having an affair with a married man she worked with and that man knew Jackson existed but never gave a shit. Huh? Why would you do that? Why? That takes so much away from his character. It felt like shoved in drama randomly added at the end of the season, and that does absolutely nothing for Jackson. Again, I didn't like hate it, but it was such a weird decision to make. Like, what an awkward way to end his story. I also feel pretty indifferent towards Amy and Isaac's relationship. I don't particularly think they're a great fit, but I also don't care enough to dislike it. It makes sense for Amy to learn to be intimate with someone again after everything she's gone through, but I also just 
don't like Isaac. I'm sorry, but he's such a dick. He's so mean to everyone all the time. Sometimes it's justified, but most of the time it's not. He's just kind of a condescending asshole. And the show does acknowledge that he's really mean, so it's not just me. But then it does nothing about it. He just remains mean. I guess the storyline is important to help Amy figure out parts of herself. Amy Lou Wood, who plays the role of Amy in the show, yes, they're both named Amy, has said in an interview like a year or so ago that Amy often feels insecure because she's aware that people think she's dumb. She's kind of similar to Adam in that way. They're not the brightest of characters, but they hate that people look at them like they're stupid. Amy has a lot of emotional intelligence, but she has a tendency to speak without really thinking. Like, she has no filter. Whatever goes through her head just comes out of her mouth, and that's what makes people look at her a certain way. And season 4 plays that off perfectly in episode 1 when she asks Isaac point blank if he's into art because he's disabled. Which is such a fucked up thing to say. I've never done art before, but I'm reading this book that says art can help process trauma, so... Oh, is that why you do art? To process trauma? Because you're disabled? That was kind of awkward, guys. If you think about it, that's a little awkward. And she doesn't really understand that the things that come out of her mouth vastly impact the perception people have of her. So yeah, throughout the season, she learns to be more considerate of people's feelings and to be more careful with her words by developing a relationship with Isaac. Fine, I get it, but I still don't care about their relationship. I also feel very fucking neutral about Viv's storyline this season. I find Viv to be quite an underrated character. She's fantastic in season two, but heavily silent sideline in season 3, and this season she has a dedicated subplot that didn't really land for me. Long story short, we watch Viv as she meets a guy and jumps headfirst in what quickly turns out to be a pretty abusive relationship, as the guy whose name I don't remember turns out to be a jealous control freak that progressively acts more and more insane. I like the themes attached to it and certain of the scenes that play out, like Jackson sensing that something about Viv's boyfriend is off or Viv getting increased increasingly impatient and defensive when confronted about her boyfriend being weird. I also like the progression of her boyfriend's abusive behavior and the way he tends to escalate the relationship status to justify his behavior. Like I thought all of that was really well done. And again, I didn't dislike it, but I think in the end it falls very flat, especially because that's the end of Viv's story. She gets into an abusive relationship and then tells the guy she never wants to see him again. And that's it. It's an important topic, and I think the show does a solid job at showing how being stuck in a relationship like that can kind of sneak up on you. But overall, I don't think this storyline held the emotional weight it wanted to have, because there wasn't enough time to develop it. So, yeah neutral. I feel very neutral about Ruby's storyline this season. Now, distinction, I don't feel neutral about Ruby. I fucking love Ruby, and I think Mimi Keen doesn't get enough credit for her insane performance as this character. Like, seriously, she is way too good in this role. I know you guys don't really buy into the whole not talking behind people's back thing, and that, like, being kind is, you know, your brand. Love it. But, uh, I'm not gonna tell anyone, you can, uh, you can give me the cost. But Ruby's storyline in season four is just sort of all right. I think it's good when it comes to explaining why Ruby puts so much effort and care in always looking sharp and dressing well. I think it touches on why she feels the need to be friends with popular kids. The backstory is there. And when it comes to the aftermath of her relationship with Otis, I think it's fine. It does an okay job at showing there are still feelings there on her end and Otis is not very fair to her. But it takes her a moment to realize she doesn't actually want to be friends with Otis and the show ends with her deciding to move on and she tells Otis to fuck off. I think it's cool. I'm glad they didn't just sideline Ruby like they did as soon as she and Otis broke up in season three. I think the fan reaction to season three made them realize they really fucked up with that. So I'm glad because I just enjoy watching this character way too much. Like any second of screen time Ruby gets is a blast. Uh, this is a no cause. So where am I supposed to park then? But yeah, overall, the storyline itself left me feeling pretty neutral. I was like, okay, 
Sure. And lastly, the whole America storyline left me quite indifferent. I didn't care for the characters there, I didn't care for the scenes, I am so fucking tired of seeing Dan Levy everywhere against my will. Like seriously, why is he in everything? Why? The idol was enough for this year, leave me alone! And that's about it really. I'm sure there's more things I felt neutral about, but I guess I feel so whatever about them that I can't even remember them. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the biggest part. <sighs> Number three. The bad stuff. Now, I think it's important before we start to really... Otis still sucks as a character, okay? I don't give a shit. I'm gonna start right now. Otis fucking blows. He is such a bad character now. It's actually infuriating to me. Now, let's be very clear, okay? There is a false narrative out there that Otis used to be a really nice guy in seasons one and two, and that starting in season three, he became an asshole out of nowhere. And that is a notion I completely disagree agree with. I hate when people say that, and let me explain why. I'm not saying I hate it because I don't think Otis is an asshole. Otis is an asshole, but the thing is, he always was. Otis was always kind of a dick, and he was always very self-centered. I talked about it in my first video. Like, this is nothing new. He's not necessarily a bad person, but he is quite flawed, and that was always part of his character. Anyone who says Otis became an asshole out of nowhere in season 3 is just not being honest, he was always capable of very selfish things, of taking advantage of the people around him, and of being insensitive to his friends. That's always been Otis. The big difference though is that back in seasons 1 and 2, when Otis was being a dick, it always blew up in his face. Yes, he was a selfish asshole at points, but the writers never allowed him to be a selfish asshole without facing consequences for it down the line. Otis was a dick, but it was part of his art. So because he faces consequences and takes responsibility for his actions and grows as a result, Otis is a way more likable character in the first two seasons because his redeeming qualities balance very well with his flaws. That's a balance you want in any great character. But in seasons 3 and 4, that is no longer the case. Now, Otis is just a dick all the time to everyone for no reason. And I mean it, there is almost never a point to it. He's just a selfish asshole and he never faces any consequences for it. It's never really brought up and he never really grows from it. And that changes the narrative. It drastically changes the character. The show is no longer telling you that Otis is overcoming his flaws. Now, the show is telling you that being this selfish asshole is just who he is. That's just the character, and you just gotta accept it. It's no longer part of his arc, that's just his basic trait. And when you really look at it, it's kind of flagrant. Like, really, think about it. After season 2, Otis literally just stops having character development. He just stops evolving. From the end of season 2 all the way to the end of season 4, he's just kind of the same guy. And as a result, by the end of the series, he doesn't feel like he's had a real arc through the story. On the contrary, it just feels like he's back to square one. He ends the show in the exact same spot he was in when the show started, and his relationships are strange now. Otis and May's relationship was always full of layers and nuance, like it felt so fucking real, and the understanding they had for one another always felt very strong. But now... Eh... Their relationship now feels a bit contrived. Like, just to say it clearly, I did not enjoy their storyline this season. The forced drama was really annoying and felt so unnecessary, and I know that shippers don't really care about that, they just want to see them make out, but it still bothered me. And of course, there is the big twist of the season that shocked fucking everybody. The show ends with Otis and Maeve broken up. 
They do not end up together. They are not gay. Maeve decides to move back to the United States and they both agree that they cannot be together a long distance. And she leaves as they agree to not speak to each other for a while. People were so mad. Oh my god, the internet has been in flames for the past couple of weeks over this ending. Like, I think out of everything that happens in this season, this is by far the story point that made people feel the most disrespected. And um, this might be my unpopular opinion of the week, but I kind of love that ending. Like, yeah, I actually really like that Otis and Maeve don't end up together. I know shippers are gonna come from my throat for saying that, but guys, it makes sense. It makes sense for their characters. Leaving it with them finally being able to say I love you to each other and finally sleeping together. Like I'm not saying that the way it was done was perfect because it wasn't, but I think it's a solid ending for them. And the more I think about it, the more I like it. It just fits. It fits for them to move forward while carrying a part of the other with them forever. And honestly, seeing how they ruined the character of Otis that made him this selfish prick who only ever thinks about himself, it even makes more sense for him to end up alone and for Maeve to go on to meet someone better, knowing that, thanks to Otis, she now has the ability to open up and is not afraid to love and not afraid to accept love, knowing that she never has to be alone again. And I don't know, that's kind of hitting the nail on the head when it comes to the letter she wrote to Otis, the one that closes the show. Let me know if I'm alone in that, but to me, this makes sense. Now, Lori Nunn, the creator of Sex Education, has recently said in an interview that she's always been pretty set on the idea that Otis and Maeve would not end up together. Apparently, that was always the plan for her. Her reasoning is that Otis and Maeve are only 17 years old, and if they are truly soulmates, it's a difficult thing to figure out at such a young age. However, she went on to say that in her own personal headcanon, she considers that Otis and Maeve might get back together together 10 years down the line when they've matured and grown a bit. Which, okay, sure. Honestly, like I said, I kind of fell out of love with the Otis and Maeve thing. Their relationship got really weird in season 4 and I didn't particularly enjoy it, but that's not the only relationship involving Otis that got boring. Maybe we need some time apart from each other. Yeah. Otis and Eric's relationship is just kind of weird now. It doesn't feel as electric as it did in earlier seasons, and the storyline and sort of fight they have this season just doesn't really land the same. And it's not that I dislike this conflict between Eric and Otis this season, it makes sense, but my issue with it is that this is essentially a beat for beat retread of their arc in season one. Like, seriously. Are we just gonna ignore that these two had the exact same storyline with the exact same resolution three seasons ago? Harry gets upset because Otis doesn't pay attention to him when Maeve is around, to the point where he goes through some traumatic stuff and Otis never even bothers to ask how he's doing and he barely even knows about it. Otis feels left out by Eric, they fight, they don't understand each other in that moment, and then they make up at the end of the season because they realize they're basically soulmates and belong together above anything else. We've done this before, my guy. This is just recycling the storyline of season one. It's the exact same storyline. You left me alone dressed like this because you wanted to hang out with Maeve. No, no, not on purpose. But oh, you are what so self-centered. You don't care about anyone but yourself. Oh, and speaking of Eric, so if you've seen my first video on the show, you know that Eric was basically the love of my life. I adored this character so fucking much. Shuti Gatwa is truly legendary in this role, and that's from season one all the way through season four. He fucking bodies this shit. He gives the best performance in this show on a consistent basis. I will never have enough words to describe how much I love Chuti Gatwa as Eric F. Young. The guy is a gift from the gods. Please remember to recycle. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'm so oh, oh my god, it's little free cookies. Oh. Actually, the carrot bites. What's your name? 
Timothy. Timothy. Nobody was asking you. Eric was a fantastic character with such strong themes attached to him with some of the most thoughtful and genuine character writing I had ever seen. His arc of identity and self-acceptance in season one is one of my favorites on television and it made me fall in love with this character harder than I could have ever imagined. I loved Eric. Until season three. I think most people would agree that season three kind of ruined Eric. A lot of choices that were made with his storyline kind of changed the basis of his character. He went from being the most lovable dude in the world to being a bit of a heartless asshole. And unlike other assholes in the show, I don't think Eric's change was intentional. I just think it was bad writing. One thing that I particularly hate with Eric is the lack of accountability given to his character. I just talked about it with Otis, but sex education was always really good at accountability. Characters in the show rarely get to be assholes and just get away with it without any form of consequence or lesson that will significantly impact them. There's always a reckoning for characters who fail their loved ones, and unfortunately, that is something the show drastically lost sight of in the last two seasons, and it makes a huge difference. Eric is a character that goes on to to do some pretty awful shit to the people in his life. And not only does he never face any consequences for his actions, he also never finds any lesson to learn from it. He hurts people around him and then he just kind of carries on. And the show never holds him accountable for his actions. He cheats on every single one of his love interests and he just gets away with it. He spent his entire relationship with Adam, pressuring him to come out to his parents when Adam was clearly not ready to do so. And that's never something that comes up for him. He just gets tired of being with Adam and leaves him after treating him like shit and cheating on him and he literally never looks back. He doesn't give a shit. He never puts his character into question, he pieces out with little to no remorse, and the show just lets him do that with nothing to show for. It just, it makes his character such a selfish and quite cruel asshole with absolutely no regard for how his actions affect people. And overall, the more I let season 3 sit, the more I realize that it made me dislike Eric a whole lot. Uh, I will say, season 4 does fix Eric a little bit compared to season 3. Like, he's made a bit more likable. He's funny. I mean, Eric is always funny, but accountability is something that is still missing with his character. Eric's storyline this season had nothing to do with any of that stuff. Most of his arc in Sex Education 4 is about religion. And don't get me wrong here. I've always been on board with Eric being conflicted about the line between his sexuality and his Christianity. It makes perfect sense, and I think it fits his character to try to find a balance there. Not only is his religion very personal to him, it's also a big part of his family and his community. I like that for Eric, and I think it's a great theme to explore in the show because a lot of queer people who happen to be religious have faced a very severe crisis of faith in the process of accepting who they are. Now, I'm not a religious person, but I've seen that around me. It's a very real thing. Exploring that with the character of Eric, who has always tried to be himself while remaining connected with his culture, is perfectly logical. However, I think the show crosses a line that not only irks me, but also ruins this storyline altogether. And I know that everyone who has watched the season already knows what I'm about to say, but I'm still gonna say it because my guy, there is a very serious leap between having Eric finding a balance with his Christianity and his sexual identity and having Eric be subjected to prophetic visions and having him literally meet God. And if you haven't seen the season, no, this is not hyperbole. Sex Education 4, the show about teenagers figuring their lives out in a small town in the United Kingdom, suddenly in its last season, decides to shatter the boundary of the supernatural by having Eric subjected to visions of the future and having a scene where God appears to him and has a conversation with him, which is just 
fucking wild. I, I can barely believe that this sentence just came out of my mouth. It feels so out of place in this show, and I think it undermines so many of the themes around this Christianity storyline. Like, really? Eric is a prophet chosen by God? That's what we're doing? And don't get me wrong, the scene itself is really well made. There are some really good lines in it. Like when God says to Eric, I made you this bright so that people close to you can see in the dark or something like that. Like that's very beautiful and poetic. And Chuti Gatwa's performance in this scene is just fucking out of this world. It will be your life's work. I don't think so. <laughs> but it is still completely fucking absurd for this show. I'm sorry. I guess they thought it would be a great way to influence Eric's decision to become a pastor at the end of the show, which is very fitting for Eric, but it undermines everything he went through all season for the sake of what? A scene with special effects? All of the pieces were already in place for Eric to decide to step up and to become a pastor. To give a way for people who are proudly queer to be accepted in the religion. To be at peace with their faith. Everything was there. You didn't need to have Eric talk to God. I just don't understand what that choice was. How did this come about in the writer's room? I'm just, I don't know what to say. Eric F. Young talked to God, and that's the end of his story. I, okay. And look, we're here talking about the OGs, but to be honest, if we're going to talk about the bad stuff in Sex Education 4, we need to talk about the new characters. Oh my fucking god. See, a bunch of main characters from the first three seasons are gone this season. They're just written off the show. Lily is gone, Olivia is gone, Anwar is gone, Raheem, Jakob, Colin, and I gotta say, I almost feel embarrassed that I didn't even notice Ola was gone from the show until Otis mentioned it in episode two or episode three of this season. And when I saw that the cast had been like cut in half like this, I assumed this was the show attempting to manage the overpopulation problem they had with season three. If you've seen my video about season three, you know that one of my biggest pieces of criticism about it is simply that it had way too many characters. Like, it was kind of insane. The show was way too crowded and the pacing of the season was all over the place because there were just too many subplots. So while I was sad to see certain of these characters go in season 4, especially Lily, I thought the show was smart to shrink the cast to have a more focused story. Except that's not what they did at all. Sex Education 4 gets rid of several characters, not to make sure the show isn't overcrowded, but to instead replace them with a large number of new characters to take some space. And I gotta say, it wasn't a good idea. Because my guy, these new characters are not great. I would even go as far as to say, they're pretty bad. Like, all of them. I didn't really like any of them. To start with one that I really want to get out of the way, this season introduces us to Jean's younger sister, Joanna. And I'm gonna say from the get-go, this character fucking sucks. She did not work for me, like, at all. She might be one of my least favorite characters in the entire show, and while I felt emotional over her backstory, it was introduced way too late in the season, and the entirety of the resolution of her storyline is based on that backstory, which is only given to us one episode before the show ends. So like, it doesn't feel like Joanna has an arc until episode 7. She literally spends all of her time on the show being an annoying character who annoys everyone around her with no real point until randomly, at the very end of the show, she suddenly has a very heavy backstory of abuse she has never dealt with. I'm scared that if I, if I stop moving and I stop 
properly talking about what happened, then it might all catch up on me and I won't be able to pretend that I'm OK anymore. I'm heading out. <laughs> lovely and everything but it just started to feel like I was having sex with my brother you know he was started pissing with the door open all the time anyway I got back from Malaysia and I just I haven't had a show doesn't land because most of the time we know her there is no context around her she's mostly a very one-dimensional character who only appears in scenes that are designed to make her incredibly annoying and it works Joanna is annoying but unfortunately for her that's kind of it She's just annoying. We're also introduced to Jean's new boss, whose name I do not remember. I don't like her. She wasn't very funny. Whatever. I don't want to talk about her. Let's move on. So, hey, um, remember earlier when I said Cavendish College was the source of most of the season's problems? Yeah, um, every single new character that is a student of Cavendish College fucking blows. All of them, not one exception they're all bad. Abby is the most one note and surface level character this show has ever given us and her storyline is so ridiculous that I honestly thought it was a joke for a second. Basically her whole thing is that she won't allow anyone around her to gossip or say anything even slightly negative. She forces constant positivity onto people and also she hasn't had sex with her boyfriend for months but her boyfriend doesn't know why she won't have sex with him. And the big review at the end of the season is that she doesn't like talking about anything negative because it makes her feel heavy because she has a fear of rejection which doesn't really make sense and also she reveals that the reason why she's been doing everything in her power to not have sex with her boyfriend for months is because he moans when they kiss and she just finds it annoying but she never told him and that's it. That's her whole character. All of that is explained in a 40 second exposition dump in the finale and that's literally all there is to her. Her boyfriend Roman literally doesn't do anything the entire season. He's there just cause. He's upset that Abby won't have sex with him and occasionally he tells people he doesn't like straight people because he thinks they're basic. And okay, sure. I can see that. I'm pretty basic. I had coffee and a bagel this morning. That is regular as fuck. I don't disagree with him. But it's just, that's kind of it for this character. He wants to have sex with his girlfriend and he doesn't like straight people. I'm sorry, but that's fucking boring. These two are fucking boring. Oh, and just so you know, both Abby and Roman are trans characters, by the way. They're the first trans characters in the show, I believe. They could have done so much with them. They could have been so fucking cool. But for some reason, the show systematically makes the choice to give them nothing. They're just kind of there. They don't do anything. They don't matter to any storyline, but they're just there all the time it's like the writers didn't even try there is nothing to them we're also introduced to a character named aisha who is deaf and also non-monogamous and that's it that's all her character is you will never find out anything else about her i'm not kidding the most you get out of her is that she likes to gossip but abby won't let her wow riveting these characters are so fucking bland i don't understand why they're here all the time they have more screen time than Maeve. and to be perfectly clear it's not that i'm not for trans characters taking center stage again i think the most disappointing part of abby and roman is the wasted potential they could have and should have been so much more it's not that i'm not for a deaf character taking center stage or becoming the main character whether it be for characterizing or for representation. My wife is deaf. I know very well the importance of having that representation, of expressing these unique struggles, but the 
character in front of it needs to feel human for it to truly work. Otherwise, you're only reducing them to a disability when they are so much more than that. My wife watched the season with me. She really appreciated that she could see herself in some experiences Aisha has in the show. But while she liked seeing all of this on screen, she also didn't form any particular connection with Aisha as a character because there simply isn't much more to her. She saw things she recognized in her, but she didn't fully relate to the character because this character doesn't feel like a person. She feels like a message. She feels like a checklist item for every single minority the show wants to shove in there. The best way I have to describe it is this. It feels like the show got high on the praise it was given for the amazingly thoughtful representation it showed in early seasons, and it let that praise get to its head and developed a pretentious need to represent everything. Every season needs to outwoke the previous one and so they shove as many queer and disabled characters as they can so they can say they included them but it doesn't do much anymore because these characters don't do anything and are barely given storylines they're not characters they're checklist items and when they get to have big moments they're reduced to pandering sequences where they spend entire minutes explaining the message behind their character's identity out loud. It's literally the opposite of what this show used to do. It's literally the opposite of why the representation of the show was praised in early seasons. And I think this directly links back to what I personally consider to be the single biggest problem with Sex Education 4, and that is simply that I believe the show lost its biggest, most powerful asset its authenticity. In my first video about sex education where I covered the first two seasons, I mainly talked about how the show had a unique ability to outsmart stereotypes. More specifically, I referred to the show as a giant middle finger to tired tropes and cliches that have become way too common and overused in film and television. And it was really smart about being that too. The first two seasons of the show repeatedly make a point of introducing extremely cliche characters full of genre stereotypes attached to them, but only to then deconstruct them and subvert the expectations linked to those stereotypes. It did it with a real goal. All of the themes addressed in the show were addressed with such a firm sense of emotion, respect, and coming back to the main point, with a firm sense of authenticity. And this authenticity, this earnest, genuine, and pure desire to represent intelligently is what made sex education. It was the source of all of its charm and the focus of its brilliant writing. But all of that is kind of gone now. Sex Education 4 feels like a CW version of the previous seasons. All of the intelligent and thoughtful commentary about sexuality, race, and culture is gone in favor of excessive, severely disingenuous and condescending and forced wokeness that treats the audience like idiots. All the subtlety and, again, the authenticity are gone. It all feels artificial now and it's super noticeable because sex education used to be so good at representation. And it's weird because I've been doing a lot of reading to see what audiences thought about this season and when I look online, all I hear from audiences about sex education for is how everything about it feels incredibly forced and disingenuous. And I can't help but agree and it breaks my heart a little that I agree. The show has kind of lost its magic and it's now now like a pale version of its former self. People from the LGBTQ plus community have been super critical of the new season's representation of queer people. I've seen some people calling it excessive, unrealistic, and dishonest, which is a theme that comes back a lot with this season. And now, I'm not queer, so I don't really have the street cred to talk about this in detail, but it is kind of crazy that this is the discourse from within the community. And if you'd like to comment down below, I'd be very curious to read your thoughts on that because clearly something is not clicking here. A number of things don't click here. There is a huge disconnect when it comes to season 4's intentions and its execution. And this is where we need to talk about the biggest new character of the season. This is where we need to talk about 
Oh. I mentioned the character very early in the video, and now it's time for her to get her unfortunate spotlight. O is a character that went really wrong. The reason why I say that is because I feel like O is a character that completely backfired. She's a great idea on paper that was very very poorly executed. As of right now, a gigantic portion of the overwhelming backlash Sex Education 4 has been slammed with is centered around this character. There are few words to describe how much people fucking hate her guts. O is a particularly despised character, and it's honestly not difficult to see why, but there are so many layers to it that I need to take a moment to talk about it. So let me paint the picture here. O is basically the antagonist of season 4. She's not a full-fledged villain like Hope was in season 3. Instead of being a villain that goes up against the whole cast like Hope, O acts more like a direct nemesis slash rival to Otis, and sort of by proxy, a nemesis to Ruby, who is a part of her backstory. She's introduced in episode 1, when Eric and Otis find out there is already a sex therapist at Cavendish College, who is extremely popular, both on campus and on social media. Wow. She's just like you. Except she's doing it on a much bigger and better scale. Otis and O are immediately established as rivals who are going to fight over their status of student sex therapist. O has been around for much longer and is beloved by her peers, while Otis, who is convinced O stole his idea, is new and has to convince people that he's the one who should have that position. And from the very first time they met, you get the sense that O is very two-faced. Basically, it's the classic. You have your protagonist and the antagonist in his way. So. Why does that matter? I mean, if O is the villain, cool, let her be the villain. I don't think anyone's gonna have a problem with that. The issue here, though, is that, um, O wasn't meant to be a villain. The intention behind the character was never for her to be perceived as an antagonist. That reception was completely accidental. And that's what I mean when I say this character went wrong. Let me explain. Earlier in this video, I talked about Yasmin Benoit, the writer of season 4 who explained that this season was not written with the intention of being the final season. Well, now she's front and center. She is very important to the conversation about O, so listen up. See, Yasmin created O. That's her character. That's her baby. O was super important to her because, just like O, Yasmin is an asexual woman of color, and she felt like that is a particular group of people that is widely underrepresented in media. So she decided to create a character for sex education that would be a stepping stone for much needed representation, an asexual woman of color that is a main character on a major Netflix production. Pretty fucking cool if you ask me. Asexual people are very underrepresented in pop culture, and they tend to be suppressed pretty heavily. I think the most well-known example is Jughead Jones from Archie Comics, who is very well known for being canonically asexual in the source material, and yet the CW adaptation of Archie Comics, Riverdale, completely killed this aspect of his character. That's just kind of what happens. So that's honestly huge. O is an important character to have in such a popular show. A lot of people are going to feel seen here. Yasmin, along with other writers, designed the character to be very attaching, and O was intended to go through a very specific arc that would make people feel for her, understand her, and hopefully like her. But then, O very abruptly turned out to be the villain of the season, and by far the most despised character in sex education. Which is a pretty sharp signal that a number of things happened between the time the character was created and the time the season came out. And long story short, everything went wrong. After the season came out, Yasmin went on a whole Twitter rant entirely centered around the character of O and the reception she had, especially after she saw the insane amount of backlash directed at her. And she explained a lot of very interesting things. According to Yasmin, O was never meant to be a villain, and she was meant to be a much more heartfelt and sympathetic character than what we ended up seeing. She claims that a lot of O's scenes were either altered or edited out, which 
essentially formed a completely different story for her that makes her seem way more unlikable than she initially was. And if what Yasmin is saying is true, then yeah, I understand her frustration. Because when you watch the show, O comes across as smug, mean-spirited, cold, and downright manipulative. Most of her scenes in the season are focused on her being here to torment Otis and to taunt him. And at certain points, she's quite cruel to him for seemingly no reason. Like, this is a completely different character from the one Yasmin describes. Yasmin says that she thinks O's storylines and scenes might have been altered by fear that Otis would come across as way too big of an asshole. So most of the scenes where he's being a dick to O were cut out, but all of the scenes where O retaliates were left in, which makes it look like O is just bullying Otis for no real reason. The best example of that, and probably one of the most criticized and talked about scenes in the season, is, of course, the infamous debate sequence. In episode 5, Otis and O face each other in front of the school in a sort of political debate debate ahead of an election that would have students of Cavendish vote to decide which one of these two will be the definitive sex therapist of the school. During that debate, it's very clear that O has no intention to play fair. She brings up the books that are written by Otis's father, who Otis doesn't really have a relationship with, and she tries to create a regressive narrative suggesting that Otis supports his father's achy writing, and she paints this picture of Otis that brands him as a bigoted misogynist. In order in order to attract a woman, the modern man finds himself unable to assert his natural authority. I don't see how this is Thank relevant. you, Otis. If you don't mind, I'd like to finish. It's a low blow that shows very clearly to the audience that O plays dirty and is dishonest and quite cruel. Then, Otis decides to counter that by exposing O for ghosting people, getting support from directly concerned students who confirm having started a relationship with O and being unceremoniously ghosted. Otis's angle here is to make people wonder if they can really trust O to care about their issues when she can't even care or respect the people in her own life enough to treat them with decency. It's a very logical play, and unlike O, Otis might actually have a point here. But that is when shit goes fucking crazy. Because right after that, O steps up and takes responsibility for her actions by coming out as asexual in front of everybody. Basically, she explains that she ghosted people because she didn't know how to communicate that she was ace and she didn't know what else to do. So, she just ghosted them. Okay, but then, O pulls a move that makes her come across as the biggest manipulator in the world because she takes this narrative and then spins it around to turn the blame onto Otis claiming that he just forced her to come out publicly when she wasn't ready to. That shit crazy. That shit crazy, bro. That's wild. That's crazy. That shit wild. Fuck. She's basically saying that he outed her, even though Otis had no fucking idea O was ace. He was just pointing out that she ghosted people, which she did. Now, not only is that insane because Otis didn't force her to do anything, she could have just apologized for ghosting people and take accountability, but the scene plays out in a way that makes O look like she's using her ace identity as a shield. She makes it sound like ghosting them was the only option she had. Like, this whole scene seems to be solidifying O as an antagonist, as this cruel manipulator, calculated villain who is ready to use anything, any narrative, any angle to destroy Otis. And it is kind of crazy to me that this was not the intention at all. Yasmin Benoit claims that this scene and the storyline that led up to it were severely altered. According to her, in the original version, Otis's part plays out differently, and he actually does put O in a position where she is forced to come out as ace. He apparently had a bunch of additional scenes where he gets so desperate to defeat O that his morals go out the window and he starts doing a lot of very ugly things, but these scenes were subsequently removed. Basically, it was supposed to make more 
more sense, and the audience was supposed to feel bad for O and kind of side eye Otis for doing something so messed up. But again, because a lot of it was allegedly cut out or rearranged, the outcome makes Otis come across way better than intended and more like a victim, which in turn makes O come across as an insane person who gaslit everyone into believing that Otis is a dangerous misogynist who forced her to come out to the entire school when he very clearly didn't. Yasmin also claims that a huge chunk of O's backstory was cut out from the show and made her look even worse. In a flashback that is shown in episode 3, we learn that O bullied Ruby when they were kids. Basically, she exposed Ruby to all the girls from elementary school for wetting the bed at night and gave her the nickname Bedwetter. Ruby was already struggling with girls bullying her for being poor, so it was an added bullet that she had to take. In the show, this revelation worked more as a confirmation that O is indeed a bully, that she's shady, and it makes her look like more of a villain hiding behind a perfectly curated facade. But according to Yasmin, this flashback is missing a big part of storytelling that serves as crucial context about O's struggle with growing up Ace. It was a flashback that was meant to introduce themes of inner struggles that would have carried her character through the season while explaining why she felt like she had to throw Ruby under the bus to protect herself. Yasmin basically explains that the rest of the flashback was supposed to be about O receiving Ace phobic bullying and deflecting the focus on Ruby out of fear. Those themes were then supposed to be brought home at the end of the season in the scene where Otis and O are stuck in an elevator together. It was supposed to touch on how O had lived her entire life impacted by race, privilege, and ace phobia, but all of it was cut. So basically, as a result of all of this, the season makes it seem like O hurts people intentionally, unprompted, just out of nowhere. And the little amount of explaining we do get in the season is mentioned through quick exposition in passing, which doesn't really do the character any favors. And by the end of the show, you don't really feel any form of sympathy for her because it doesn't feel earned. O was meant to be a lovable but flawed character, but in the end, we're left with a version of O that had all of her redeeming traits taken away, leaving only her flaws and painting a completely different picture of who she is. And Yasmin says that one of the most difficult aspects of that for her is that, as a result, the show essentially takes the asexual character and portrays her as cold and almost emotionless, which is a very dangerous stereotype to continuously attach to the Arrow Ace community. O was not supposed to be an antagonist. We were supposed to see her as a woman of color who was successful in a specific field, but sees her success being ripped away by a white guy who believes he deserves it more than her. But somewhere along the line, it all went wrong. As for Yasmin, she insists that despite the backlash, she is very proud to have been able to create and work on this character with other writers, and explains that O is the first asexual woman of color on a British TV show. Which, honestly, slay. Big slay. I would even call you a slay-sual. Subscribe. Number four. The finale. The final episode of the show is pretty much a mixed bag. It's not necessarily good, but not particularly bad either. The episode is basically a movie, it's an hour and 25 minutes long, and it mostly revolves around Cal. Yeah, I wouldn't have said that either, but at this point I'm not surprised. The premise of the episode is that Cal went missing and their mother is worried about their mental state. So she goes to the school and all of the students bend together to try and find Cal and make sure that they're safe. And while that's happening, the characters see their arts come to a close in different ways. Oh, and Maeve is back in America with Dan Levy, but who cares? So yeah, we follow the characters one last time as their stories all get wrapped up. Jean has learned to deal with her depression and has accepted that in order to to get through this new normal, she is gonna need to accept help and she's gonna need to accept that it's also okay to ask for it. She takes a major step forward in her life and finds a sense of stability. It's a very strong end to her story and I'm very happy about that. Eric talks to God and decides to become a pastor. There you go. I will say, his final monologue in the church about being unable to reconcile his religion with his pride of being a gay man is really emotional and sad, especially because the church still chooses to reject him. But overall, Eric's ending is 
fine. It's kind of whatever. I don't have a big opinion on it. Otis is an asshole who only ever thinks about himself, and that's literally all the finale is about for him. He doesn't learn anything and doesn't evolve. I guess he becomes friends with O and they decide to run the sex thing together. Good for them. Could not care less about Otis's ending. Ruby decides that she doesn't want to be Otis's friend, and that's literally the last time you see her. That's the end of her story. I find it kind of lame. I think her character deserved more, but okay, go off. I still love Ruby, but her story just feels a little incomplete. Jackson finds his biological father, who brutally rejects him and tells him to fuck off and never come back, and then his moms tell him he's really the product of an affair, and then they tell him they love him, and he's like, okay, and then you never see him again. That's how his story ends. Oh, also, he doesn't have cancer. It was a false alarm. Um... Yeah. It's not a bad ending, per se. I think it's okay. I really like Jackson as a character, so I'll take what I can get. Oh, and also, Hannah Weddingham is back, and I will always be happy about Hannah Weddingham on my screen. Adam and his father finally manage to build a relationship, and Adam accepts that his parents want to be together again. They reunite at the end, and it's the fucking best ending ever. Season 4 is mid as hell, but the writers never fucking missed once with the Groffs. I adore and cherish this ending so much. However, I feel like I need to ask, who the fuck is Adam's sister and where is she? What? You thought I wouldn't remember that Michael mentioned that Adam has a sister in season one? She's literally never mentioned again. But I didn't forget Netflix. I didn't forget. 10 out of 10 ending. I'd send the writer some flowers if I could. Amy finds her passion in photography and finally finds it in her to be physically intimate with someone again. Her healing process has truly paid off and we see she's ready to give herself a chance to be happy. Good ending. Amy Lou Wood fucking bodied this role from start to finish. Maeve lives happily ever after in the US. That's it. Cal almost unalives themselves, ends up not doing it, and goes home. They say they're not ready to face people after getting them worried, and then you never see them again. It's the most incomplete story out of the main cast. Viv moves on after getting out of her abusive relationship and stands up for herself. It's fine. I feel pretty neutral about it. Still love Viv, though. Underrated character. Oh, and I, I guess there's the new characters. Yeah, whatever. Abby and Roman have sex. That's it. That's the end of the show for them. Aisha literally does not have an ending. Do you know why? Because she never had a storyline to begin with. Jean's sister, Joe finally admits she has never dealt with the trauma from the abuse she was subjected to by her mother's boyfriend when she was young. And I could have cared about it if that major backstory hadn't been randomly revealed one episode before the end. Joe is still an annoying and one note and severely underwritten character. Just because her backstory is sad doesn't make her profound. I'm sorry. O becomes nice, just like that just because so i guess she's redeemed yay and that's pretty much it that's the end of sex education the show closes with a voiceover of Maeve reading the letter she wrote to otis before going back to america she tells him that meeting him was the first time in her life she didn't feel alone and talks about how much otis means to her and then as otis walks to his window to stare into the distance Maeve ends the series with the final line of the letter i think what i'm trying to say is Thanks for everything, dickhead. And that's it. Look, there is no denying that Sex Education 4, despite having its moments, was a major letdown. I think everyone would agree that this final season was really disappointing. It is by far the show at its weakest. In certain aspects, it feels like the show has become a parody of itself. The writing is really weak, except when it's fucking amazing out of nowhere. And overall, the whole vibe of this season is just off. The show lost its authenticity, its vision of representation has become very superficial, and again, there are too many characters and not enough time for all of them. It's just not a good season. I don't love it. With all that said though, I don't think Sex Education is a show that I will remember negatively. Some shows have final seasons that just ruin everything to the point where you never really want to revisit the show, but I don't think this is the case for me. I think I will always look back on this show fondly and it will always have a special place in my heart. Like these first two seasons really marked me, man. Maeve Wiley is a character that is infinitely precious to me. Adam has one of the best arcs in teen television. My 
Michael Groff as one of the best redemption arcs ever in TV, and I stand by that. Ruby owned season three, and I will attempt to remember Eric only by the first two seasons. We'll see what we can do. Sure, sex education kind of shit the bed in the end, but there is so much good that came out of this show. I think it shouldn't be forgotten. I believe the disdain around season four will die down and people will eventually be able to remember the show with a more positive outlook. At least I hope. Again, I'm very curious to know more of people's thoughts on this season. I felt so conflicted about it while watching it and I think my wife was in the same boat. So if you'd like to leave your thoughts in the comments down below, I'd absolutely love to sit down and read through your experiences with this season. I feel like there's so much to talk about with it. Hell, this video is like three times longer than I wanted it to be because there were just too many things I needed to bring up. So overall, yeah, this was a very disappointing goodbye to a fantastic show that talked to so many people on such a deep level. I'm glad the show is over though. I don't think this is a show that would have needed to go to five, six, or seven seasons, but god damn, I really hoped it would end on a stronger note. It's not the worst ending of all time, like I wouldn't put that up there with the likes of Pretty Little Liars or How I Met Your Mother but I really get why it stings so much for so many people. If anything, I feel very excited to see what the cast is gonna do next. Chuti Gatwa is already on top of things, he's the new doctor on Doctor Who. Very curious to see his take on the character. And we just had Chuti and two other members of the cast in Barbie. Like, honestly, this cast deserves everything. Very excited for their future. Anyways, goodbye sex education, I'm done, peace out. Michael Groff is my best friend. But if you know, you know